Belling History with the Good Time Girls, a hyper-local podcast about the quirky history of Bellingham, Washington, and the fourth corner of the United States. We like to keep things close to home, but these stories are no less entertaining to the masses and those who find themselves, unfortunately, outside of the Pacific Northwest. We are your hosts. I'm Colby. And I'm Ren. And we are co-owners of Belling History Tours, also known as the Good Time Girls. If you want to know more about our tour business, visit our website at bellinghistory.com. And today's episode is called Dun 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 Bathing Beaches in Bellingham Part 2. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or something <laughs> that we might insert here. Uh, insert here. Okay. <laughs> Okay, today we're going to talk some more about Bellingham bathing beaches of yesteryear, uh, some of the places where old-time Bellingham like to cool their heels in the summer months, most of which are long gone or are very different today. In our previous episode, we talked mostly about the so-called White City at Silver Beach at Lake Whatcom, which was our very own sort of mini Coney Island-style resort. And in this episode, we'll talk about resorts at Squalicum Beach and Fort Bellingham, which are slightly less known but followed in the footsteps of the White City after its demise. So if you haven't listened to that episode, it's fine. We may reference a few things, but you can go back and listen to it if you want or not. Yeah, well, so I guess to kind of recap, people in Bellingham in the early years pretty much swam wherever they could, which was a lot of places. Uh, But as the population grew, certain folks created official bathing beaches with amenities such as bathhouses. And then came the White City Resort at Silver Beach, operated for about 10 years between 1906 and 1916. It had the bathing beach and also was basically that mini Coney Island resort. By 1922, it had been taken over by a coal mine operation and was then defunct. Yeah, it's interesting how the resorts we're going to talk about today are kind of really stepping in to fill a gap that was left after that closure of the resort at Silver Beach. And Silver Beach, I think most people remember it more for the, the roller coaster and the Ferris wheel and all of that, and not as much for the beach that was there. And this is more focused on actually, you know, swimming in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> although they did have some of those amenities as well. So we're going to cover two bathing beach resorts that became very popular in the 1920s. One was at Squalicum Beach, and the other was at Fort Bellingham. And if you don't already know where those locations are, Squalicum Beach, in our story, refers to a stretch of beach which was originally on land that is now, a lot of it's been filled around the mouth of Squalicum Creek. Today, if you go to the end of Rotor Avenue, where Squalcombe Creek comes out into the ocean, there's an old plywood plant there. There's kind of a gravel lot beyond that where you can park and access the beach there today. But I wouldn't say it's very swimmable. (laughs) In fact, my kids and I dubbed it Gross Beach because it's always like filled with garbage and rebar sticking out of the sand. And it's just weird and industrial and... Also, it's not exactly a swimming spot. It's not a bathing beach, no. per se. <laughs> it's very gravelly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Fort Bellingham was out at the site of the old Fort Bellingham, obviously, which was a military fort built on the bluff by Captain George Pickett and his men in 1856. We could do probably a whole podcast about that. So they were out here building a military road connecting that fort to Fort Stalacombe. So Fort Bellingham is long gone, but the site is currently uh, Smith Gardens off of Marine Drive. So that bathing beach was on that site, and we'll talk some more about that later. And in our previous episode, we talked about some bathing beach references from the 1890s. And we know some people were swimming at Squalicum Beach in vicinity at that time, and that improvements were gradually being made, you know, into the early 1900s. In 1914, the paper mentioned plans to improve the walk to Squalicum Beach. So access to the beach at that time, one would generally ride the streetcar to the end of the line on Eldridge Avenue, which would today be where it would cross Squalicum Creek, the bridge there. Mm -hmm. And the big old Eldridge Mansion Castle French Chateau yes. building that's yeah. out there is the old Eldridge estate from the 1920s. So around this time that we're going to be talking about today, that house was built there. 
So you would then have to descend the bluff via a steep, twisting, dusty trail, <laughs> cross the railroad tracks, and to access the beach. So the Squalcom Parkway hadn't been built yet. Seaview Drive did not exist yet. Mm. That little weird mm -hmm. road that goes down right there today. That's how you get there today. Yeah. yeah. So that came in like the 40s after this was on the, on the wane. Ugh. So the land was leased from Hugh Eldridge. The Eldridge family, of course, that was all of their donation land claim and their mansions were built up there on the bluff. So the, the land in question is described as from where Squalicum Creek entered the ocean, which is different today. It was much a right. bigger estuary. It's been kind of routed and contained. But from there to where the cement plant is. So land was leased by two gents named Williams and Stevens, who planned to install floating docks and create a bathing resort. They also built bathhouses for people to change and shower in. And in 1915, there were two separate bathhouses being operated that we know of in the vicinity. And the proprietors were at war, it seems, <laughs> over the rental of bathing suits. That's disgusting. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. So that just kind of blew my mind because, I mean, it makes sense that people wouldn't necessarily own bathing suits because it yeah. wasn't yeah, something it was, I think did. It, I think people didn't really, let's not say they didn't swim, but it wasn't quite quite appropriate for ladies to be doing that, let alone, right. I mean, boys probably, you know, in the last episode we talked about their aboriginal attire yeah. that they may have used. So I think by the time it caught on to becoming more of a sport right. and a leisure activity, well, yeah. not everybody had a bathing yeah. suit. That was and a new thing to think about. You had to live somewhere with a real designated yeah. beach <laughs> to true. go to, yeah. to warrant like Having buying a whole and suit of yeah. clothing for yeah. Them. yeah, exactly. So a lot of people didn't didn't own them. Um back at this point in history, as we talked about in the last podcast, they would have been wearing probably starting to switch to more of the knit bathing suit tight fitting thing, but also we did have still that like cotton oversized, so it's not to show your curves in any right. way. And like tights and stockings. Tights and stockings. That was for still, the ladies. Still there. <laughs> I can't imagine swimming. It oh, sounds so gross. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those poor ladies. So, yeah, the paper complained that Anton Blodgett had Squalicum Beach cornered after he went to court and it was declared anyone swimming on his beach had to rent swimming suits from him. As far as we can tell, he was a salty old fisherman who had property in the area and was making some money from the bathing beach and renting suits. Some nearby had the same idea and both were trying to police whose suits were on whose beach. I love this. <laughs> so yeah, they they have sort of a little a little rivalry, and I think this goes back to, and we'll t I think we'll talk about it more. But like, you've got this beach now. How do you make money from it? You know, without just charging people specifically who you know putting a gate on the, the right. thing and charging. You know, I guess that was the brilliant idea was to have bathing suits. But now we have a problem because <laughs> just a few yards down, he's running his own bathing suits. This is capitalism at its finest, y'all. <laughs> Um, so in 1915, on August 14th, the paper says, Official Inspector of Bathing Suits on Squalicum Beach has, quote, some job. And uh, we're just going to read this all because it is historian gold. <laughs> all right. It says, Being the Iceman has nothing on the job that has been assigned to Special Officer Harry Lord of the Bellingham Police Force, for he is Bathing Suit Inspector at Squalicum Beach. During the last few days, he has become expert in keeping check on bathers by the degree of paraphernalia they wear, or, in some rare instances, the degree of lingerie they do not wear. <whistles> this is some job, quoth Harry today as he sat on the end of a drift log and officially eyed an attractive nymph clad in green bathing frock and playing in the surf. This is some job, he repeated. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I mean, the, the guy that got to write this little article here, <laughs> he was having the time of his life, it sounds like. It goes on to say, the two bathing house proprietors are at war. You see, Mr. Blodgett pays out a big bunch of coin for his lease, and therefore he wants all bathers playing on his beach to use his bathhouse. Over yonder is the Squalicum bathhouse. 
Many bathers get suits there and just naturally stroll over onto old man Blodgett's beach. That makes him pretty mad. All I have to do is stay here and form a mental picture of each fair bather that comes from the bathhouses so that if one of those from the Squalicum bathhouse gets on to Mr. Blodgett's beach, I can instruct this individual to get back into the water. It's some job, (laughs) again, repeated Harry, as he made off to get a closer view of the suit of a bather who had just left the water. So I'm dying because at the photo archives, when I went in there and looked at some of the pictures that they had of Squalcombe Beach and its bathing beach days, and there was an adorable couple, there's a photo of a couple, and they're wearing like those weird trunk kind of saggy suits of this era, and they had an embroidered bee on there, which I think was... the the, Blodgett. It could have been Blodgett. It could have been Blaney's, who we're going to get to a little later. That's true, yeah. Could have been Bellingham. We don't really know, (laughs) but I would guess that it's one of the bathhouse like that was a suit they'd rented and the bees were a way of identifying Identifying that. that. It is really freaking weird to think about renting bathing suits to people and I think uh I hope they had a good laundry system. I really hope they did some sanitization <laughs> and didn't just count on the salt water in the nasty <laughs> in the nasty bay oh, to um God. clear that up but So the whole bathhouse and suits ordeal was a thing. Here's a later letter to the editor that we found. It says, Three lady friends and myself decided to go down to the Squalicum Beach for a swim. Having no particular bathhouse in view, took the first bathhouse sign. And after going along the beach ready for our swim, was met by a big radical Greek with a three-foot club in his hand who claimed to be proprietor of Squalicum Beach. Furious because we had not rented his dressing rooms, started to shoo us off the beach, and in his excitement, hit one of us across the arm. Are our bathing beaches safe for the public? <laughs> Accidentally hit them across the like arm? A big radical grip. <laughs> I love that, but like, oh, yeah, and a three foot club? Yes, just patrolling the beach. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. That. I don't even know what to make of that. I know. <laughs> Sounds like he might have he might have just been some random guy. I'm the proprietor of their beach. Yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> There's a lot going on there. Yeah, seriously. Anyway, so in June of 1921, a couple described as Mr. and Mrs. John Taylor took over the lease of Squalicum Beach. But at the time, the paper complained, no free beach here, charge of 10 cents for all who bathe at Squalicum. Bellingham has no free bathing beach readily available to the public or that the public wants. Squalicum Beach is not free, except for picnic parties who do not swim. Every bather there must pay. It has been said that Chuckanut Bay affords a good beach, but the complaint is the water's too cold. (laughs) It is also out of the convenient reach of the thousands who much travel on streetcars. So this is the situation that confronts Bellingham, a town on salt water without a bathing beach for free public use. So already we've got public access to beaches being a concern here. Mr. and Mrs. John Taylor control Squalicum Beach. They said that they have agreed to pay Hugh Eldridge $250 for the rental of it this summer. Quote, We have been given to understand that no persons renting the bathhouse heretofore has been able to pay the rent. The renters have previously allowed free bathing except to those who use the bathhouse facilities. So in an effort to make both ends meet and get our pay, we have decided to charge 10 cents for those persons who do not make any use whatever of our bathhouse or suits. We will not make any charge for picnic parties. So I guess they're just trying to pay the rent, apparently, which is... Hi, thanks, Hugh Eldridge. (laughs) Um, So Mr. Taylor explained that he'd made improvements to the bathhouse and he'd made efforts to clean up the beach hired laborers, and done a great deal of work, and he felt he must get income from any source he could. Mr. Taylor pointed out that people in his business have but a short season and must in measure make up in the summer for the long winter when there is no business. So again, you've got this struggle in a seasonal place where you've got not a very long beach season, Yeah, and he's got to rent it probably for the year. Yeah, that $250 for, yeah, just a couple months, as we know here in Bellingham. Right. (laughs) That you can really make your money. That's not, I mean, it's not the greatest bargain as a businessman, but also I just love, I mean, the capitalism of the beach, you know, and Hugh Eldridge being like, (laughs) wow, I'll rent it to you. And like, uh, it's just, 
kind of insane. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, <laughs> I love that Chuck and I was too cold. That was the complaint. Right. <laughs> too cold, too far. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so the Taylors' tenure at Squalicum Beach was cut short by a scandal that occurred at the end of their summer season. So this is a bit of a sidetrack, but it's fun. <laughs> and should, and I think it's just great context for the city we're in here in <laughs> yep. Bellingham. In September of 1921, the headline read, Attempted shooting at hotel causes sensation. John Taylor accused of trying to fire at S. Stewart. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so John Taylor had been arrested for shooting at this guy in the lobby of the Hotel Leopold. The paper reported that the only reason the shooting did not result in murder was a misfiring of the revolver. And here we have a little quote from the newspaper. According to witnesses, Taylor confronted Stewart with a revolver, exclaiming, quote, I've got you now. See, I've got a revolver. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, advancing towards the ladder and pulling the trigger with both hands. The firing pin clicked but missed fire, and Stuart ducked behind a bellboy, Archie Gildersleeve. And then he ran through the Leopold barbershop. Pandemonium reigned in the lobby of the hotel, and several men are said to have fallen flat on the floor to escape the expected fusillade of shots. I love that. I, I love that he ducked behind a bellboy. A bellboy. Oh, my Poor God. Archie. Archie. I know. And then, do you really think that was what he said? <laughs> See? I've got a gun. Well, keep reading, because okay. it could be. Okay. The guy we'll sounds see. like he didn't really know what he was doing. <laughs> so, Taylor is said to have run out of the hotel and disappeared in the corridors of the First National Bank building, a.k.a. the lighthouse block on the corner where the Bank of America is today, which was notorious like spinny and yeah. little hallways and things. Um, he was where he was found by police. Also, the gun, which he had stashed in a toilet tank, was found. Brilliant. I'm imagining the old toilet that had like the long oh, stem yeah. and the tank was like up at the top and he's just he like just, like, climbed up there. there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. At the time of that article, Taylor denied knowing Stuart, even though Stuart said he certainly knew Taylor. And the paper chalked it up as, quote, probably a case of the eternal triangle. <laughs> Which it was. This is shocking. <laughs> because a few days later, it came out that wife of Taylor is married to Stewart. Wait, what? <laughs> so, so apparently Mr. and Mrs. Taylor were merely common law married. And Mr. Stewart was a friend of theirs who'd been staying at the resort. Clearly, Mr. Stewart and Mrs. Uh, Ish Taylor became more than <laughs> friends. For they eloped to Canada and were officially married there. It also came out that the failure of the shells which Taylor purchased to fit the gun snugly is all that saved the life of Stewart. Apparently, the clerk at Morse Hardware testified that Taylor appeared to be a rank amateur with a gun. So wait, he bought the wrong size. So I think yeah, that's what bullets. It, they were, they were, <laughs> and the guy just sold it to him anyway. Too small. Like, whatever. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Because he knows, yeah. <laughs> this guy's an idiot. Good job, Morse Hardware yeah. salesman. <laughs> All right, Morse. Um, so he was deemed not to be crazy, though he had been reportedly acting queer, quote, for some time. He was facing some serious prison time. Uh, a few days later, Taylor denied he was guilty and also issued the following statement. I want the public to know that I conducted a respectable place there on Squalcombe <laughs> Beach. He pled not guilty to a charge of assaulting Sidney Stewart at Hotel Leopold September night with the intent to kill. The stories that have been in the papers give the impression that we conducted a bad place there at Squalcombe. This isn't true, as the neighbors will tell you. We were careful in all respects and run a morally clean summer resort. I want it understood that I am a man of honor. I love that, like, his main concern was, like, was the, the beach. <laughs> <laughs> we run a clean resort yeah. at Squalicum Beach. <laughs> I know. So the rumors must have been flying after his wife went and got married on him by some dude that was staying with him. <laughs> the woman he didn't marry for whatever reason. Yeah. He's just like, whatever, we're common law. We're common law. We're cool. I don't know. That's just interesting to me at the time. Love. So we are not quite sure. We know he did some time in the state pen. I couldn't find when he got released, but he was sentenced. <laughs> so by Taylor's. <laughs> that was a fun <laughs> little mm -hmm. side story, though. The following season in 1922, the port was offering the city park board use of Squalicum Beach property near the waterway that would be suitable for a bathing beach and making it public. 
But again, it would entail considerable expense. So (laughs) even when we talk about public beaches, somebody's got to maintain it and pay for it. And that usually comes out of taxes and park funds and things like that. So it's not clear if anything happened or that ever materialized. But meanwhile, in June of 1922, a new resort had opened at Fort Bellingham. Quote, bathers and dancers of Bellingham will be given an opportunity to indulge in their favorite sports at Fort Bellingham Thursday night and thereafter the rest of the summer. So brothers William T. and Carl R. Lang of the Bellingham Ice Company were named as the proprietors. Though later I found another brother of theirs, Fred Lang, was also listed as involved with running the place. But the name stuck out to me. I was like, why is this familiar? And I remembered and um, confirmed that William T. Lang was the man who, a few years later after this time, was divorced and sued by his own wife uh, in a scandalous case, which made the papers because he had built and maintained a home on North Forest Street for one of our favorite local madams, Joy Stokes. And their affair had allegedly begun around the time when the Lang brothers are opening Fort Bellingham Beach. So Mm. I have lots of pictures of Joy Stokes from the 20s, and I love imagining her out up there on the beach with one of her suitors, of which I'm sure there were many. (laughs) Apparently one of these brothers hanging out there. One of the Lang bros. crazy. (laughs) She was gorgeous, too. A redhead. Uh. Partial. (laughs) So this... Fort Bellingham Resort was about two miles, though, from the end of the Eldridge streetcar line, which stopped there at that bridge crossing Squalcombe Creek. So to get there, if you took the streetcar, you could take a stage (laughs) from Marietta that passed back and forth every 20 minutes or so. Or I guess you could walk. Or if you had an automobile, you could just drive on out. Mm -hmm. So they had more than 50 dressing rooms, and they had the indoor shower baths. They had a dancing pavilion and cottages where you could go and stay, rent them for the weekend, electric lighting, all the amenities. So that started up. Yeah, back at Squalicum, pretty quickly after Fort Bellingham Beach opened, the beach at Squalicum Creek, owned by Hugh Eldridge, was leased for 10 years to Mr. James W. Blaney. Blaney and his wife, Emma, were former vaudevillians. Adorably, they were also both born in Oregon and met as schoolmates. Then they learned to ride bicycles and do tricks and went on the circuit as performers, known as the Famous Martells. So cute. I would definitely go to their bathing beach. Yeah, can you imagine? This, like, I just picture them at, like, the Circus Guild oh, doing know. cute bicycle tricks little, and old timey oh, outfits. Little tights and little <laughs> swimsuit. Oh, man. They had four children, and J.W. Blaney was also a bowling alley operator. He had various bowling alleys around the P&W, including in Bellingham. He was super into bowling. <laughs> and he won a lot of trophies. I love this though. They got they got out of the vaudeville biz, but they're still in the entertainment yeah. biz. Yeah. I think it's so great. I like bowling and bathing beaches. Yeah, I love it's a it. Winning combo. And they're the Blaney's. The Blaney's. Lots Blaney's. of bees. Blaney's bowling bathing beaches. <laughs> So the Blaney's took over Squalicum Beach and began constructing a dancing pavilion, because I guess every good bathing beach needs a dancing pavilion. Um, I know, that, that blows my mind. But it's just <laughs> a thing. <laughs> just go and dance at the beach. Yeah, I would do that. Mm-hmm. The Blaney's, as vaudevillians and bowling alley operators, were no strangers to entertainment and tourist attractions, and they were not daunted by the competition of Fort Bellingham. They actually had the more convenient location closer to town and on the streetcar line. Sadly, in in July, after being open a mere month, the newly constructed dance pavilion burned down, taking a piano and a floor sanding machine with it. <laughs> the Blaney's immediately made plans to rebuild the pavilion at once with a larger structure, which would have a veranda on all sides, and they also planned a wider stairway to be constructed to the top of the hill. So I'm assuming that old one, it was an old dance pavilion. I think they had just built it. They had just it. built it. Oh. And then they were like, but don't worry, we're going to make a bigger, better one. So we'll just put more money (laughs) into it. Oh my God. And pray that this one doesn't burn down. So the dance pavilion was built, but the Blaney's then had another setback when the Great Northern Railroad tore out their newly constructed stairway. Dicks. 
An open letter from Blaney was published in August in the newspaper. It said, After going to considerable expense building a nice walk from Eldridge Avenue to Squalcombe Beach for the accommodation of Bellingham people, the Great Northern Railroad tore the entire stairway out because it was partly on their right-of-way. I offered to furnish a bond to relieve the railway company of all liabilities and also applied for a permit, but the Great Northern says it must come out. So they took it out. So I wish to announce that I have had electric lights strung along the old pathway until I can make better arrangements. J.W. Blaney, proprietor and manager, Squalcom Beach Dance Pavilion. Such <laughs> rude. I mean, they didn't even say anything. They just tore it out, it sounds like. Right? Right? <laughs> She's like, like you just show you. up and like, where's our stairway? Where's the big ass expensive stairway? <laughs> uh, the following season, though, the Blaney's came back better than ever. In May 1923, the papers announced Bellingham will be introduced to one of the finest bathing beaches in the Northwest, with Mayor Mathis himself delivering the opening address. Extensive improvements were touted. They had electric lighting, boardwalks, a free gas kitchen and camp tables with sunroofs. The beach has undergone a thorough cleaning. Driftwood and seaweed have been removed. Aquatic chutes and diving platform have been built, which bathers will welcome. And the kiddies who can't swim and who must stay on the beach have not been forgotten. Blaney has installed swings and teeters, a big shoot the chutes, and other contraptions to amuse the youngsters. 200 electrically lighted bathhouses for men and women, shower baths with hot and cold fresh water, a cool and comfortable light lunchroom, and cold drink fountain add to the general summer equipment. That is fucking fancy. <laughs> 200? Yeah, 200 that's a lot. 200 bathing so, changing rooms. Yeah, well, I mean, he's expecting a lot of people, oh, clearly. That's crazy to think about. Like, that is massive. And a little lunchroom. We need this again. I know. And, like, they're like, we got a playground for the little kids. Yeah. Oh, I it's know. Really the, a, the teeters <laughs> and the shoot the shoots. I was like, well, that doesn't sound Slides safe. I wouldn't. I know. I wouldn't be making it in the shoot the shoots. <laughs> So, oh, and the Blaney, this is good. This is important mm-hmm. for what we were talking about earlier. The Blaney's also installed a washroom with an electric washer to clean the rented bathing suits in order to keep them thoroughly sterilized. So, they thought so of they everything. were like hand washing that shit before? Yeah, I, I think they just <laughs> fucking weren't. <laughs> <laughs> Just hang them in the sun. The sun will sterilize it. It's fine. (laughs) Somehow, also, Blaney got his stairs without the railroad tearing them out. The dance floor in the new dancing pavilion dome was praised as being excellent. Other contraptions, including a (laughs) merry-go-round and a Ferris wheel. There were also shooting galleries and the like, giving it familiar Coney Island slash White City feeling. They really, they really fucking did it. Those vaudevillians. Mm -hmm. We just need to leave it to the circus folk. Right? I think... (laughs) People who know entertainment. Yes. Uh, <laughs> ads that year asked, why go long distance? A wonderful bathing resort at home. The new Squalicum Bathing Beach. It makes me so happy for them. I know. <laughs> also, they're like, they get their competitors. Like, yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're right in Bellingham. Hey, why, <laughs> why get on the stagecoach? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and there would have been other competing places, like uh, Birch Bay was Mm -hmm. already a thing at that time. There was bathing beaches on Lummi Island. Mm -hmm. So, an article from 1923 is talking about bathing is popular. Bathing beaches from Bellingham to Blaine, lots of bees again, (laughs) (laughs) are lined. Bathers and picnickers flocked to the shores of Birch Bay, Cottonwood Beach. The absence of sufficient parking was noted, although several inroads to the shade of timber along the shores have been cleared and parking room is greater than it was a year ago. I love that cars were a yeah, thing. Yeah, now by that's the thing we have to think mm-hmm. about, damn it. Parking <laughs> is now an issue. Uh, and then it says the bathing resorts on Bellingham Bay, Squalicum Beach, and Fort Bellingham equally well patronized. During the afternoon, hundreds of persons visited beaches on which thousands of dollars have been spent, making them much more attractive and convenient than they have ever been. So in August of that year, the largest picnic ever held occurred on Blaney's Beach when more than 1,000 sailors from visiting ships were fed hot dogs and roasting ears, which I guess is corn. I hope it's corn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, corn, 
roasting ears. <laughs> and then it says, Many civilians taking their own lunches to share with the Blue Jackets helped swell the crowd to record-breaking proportions. The dancing pavilion was crowded to capacity, hundreds of eager couples dancing to the music of Sam Rathman's orchestra. I love picturing, like, all the old-timey sailors and people dancing in a pavilion. Yeah. And and everybody knew how to fucking dance, and it has just been, like, such a yeah. party. Oh, my God. So amazing. To top it all off, there was a fireworks display from the diving stand. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so the Blaney's Resort continued on in this fashion for another few years. And then an article from 1926 said that the trustees of the Bellingham Terminals Syndicate in a meeting had reached an agreement with J.W. Blaney, the owner of Squalcombe Beach, whereby he agreed to remove several hundred feet westward whenever expansion of the Squalcombe Creek water way required it. So he was going to get six months notice. Mm. He also released his option to purchase the ground that he was on. Mm. And the syndicate agreed to bear the cost of removing his resort. And it said that years may pass before this might happen, Mm -hmm. but also it's kind of a sign of what's to come. Like, so already we've got industrial uh, interests who are like, yep, we're going to fill this in and build our industry here. And we need this. Your water. little <laughs> bathing beach is going to have to move on down the line, mm-hmm. sir. So, um, but seemingly undaunted, Blaney took out another extended lease the following year in 1927 and announced plans to build a natatorium, Yay. another swimming pool. <laughs> so now we know what that word <laughs> means. And a new roadway with parking spaces for 400 cars. Shit. Which is a lot. That is a lot. He also built two new chutes. Of course, got to have your chutes. I have a chute. Uh, chute. <laughs> and I love that in this summer, he actually made the news because he was got a little creative with advertising and that he used a <laughs> mule and an ancient carriage <laughs> to advertise the wonders and pleasures of Squalicum Beach. But it was said they had no place on the city streets, according oh, to the whoa. council. And um, they ordered Blaney to take his mule and wagon and said he was violating a traffic ordinance. <laughs> prohibiting promiscuous advertising by banners on cars and vehicles in the city streets. Wow, what a bunch of killjoys. Yeah, bummer. Wow. I think that'd be so cute. Everybody's like, probably so happy to see the, the mule, mule and a little wagon. And Jesus, it's the 20s. It wasn't that long <laughs> since we used those. Like, I'm just Ew. like, aren't there still horses <laughs> yeah. happening right now? Yeah. I guess it was the advertising. Yeah, it was the, it was those banners. Yeah. The promiscuous like, banners. Promiscuous <laughs> banners. Blaney. <laughs> Keep it on the beach. Yeah, that's what you get. <laughs> so the billions. <laughs> the following year, uh, Blaney seemed to be having second thoughts. He offered to sell the whole shebang oh. to the city parks board. And that same year, he opened a new bowling alley in the Montague McHugh building, which is at the corner of Railroad and Holly, where K-pop is. K-pop chicken, where yeah. the Bob's Burgers used yeah, to be there. Yeah, Bob's Burgers, the and old the... Travel Lodge Motel, as I think oh, of it. Oh, is that what it was? That whole building was a Travel Lodge. Yeah. Whoa, downtown hotel. <laughs> I Who know. knew? It was pretty gnarly. Pretty janky, I can't even imagine. Also in 1928, Fort Bellingham announced a new pool described as a huge enclosed saltwater plunge. And they had some kind of enormous filter. I think it used charcoal or something to clarify the seawater. So this was enclosed. It was 50 by 100 feet, two and a half feet in the shallow end, eight and a half feet at the deepest end. And it was warmed by a boiler. Damn. Right? So they said, quote, the Lang brothers will furnish Bellingham with a place to bathe, which will not depend upon the warmth of the outside (laughs) air for people's patronage, as swimming will be agreeable and comfortable at any time. So, yeah, that was an issue. We all understand. Mm -hmm. (laughs) In 2006, Herald reporter Dean Kahn talked to 92-year-old Andy Smith from Smith Gardens. So Smith Gardens is on the site of Fort Bellingham today. And the family owns the property around there. And he was living just east. East of the site of the old pool, and he was nine years old when the Langs opened that resort oh. in 1922. Um, <laughs> so he described Lang, or whichever Lang brother, we're not sure which <laughs> one, one yeah. but he had one arm and smoked cigars, <laughs> which is awesome. Pretty awesome. rad. I love yeah. that. And apparently they lived at the top of the bathhouse there, and he showed Dean the old pilings that were placed in a V pattern off the beach and apparently had been strung with like netting or chicken wire. <laughs> Yeah. from the poles to catch kelp and debris and make sort of a cleaner little swimming area. Yeah. Which is- 
kind of genius. And then there was another interview, also by Dean, with Muriel Byron, 95 years of age, nice. who also lived near the old site and described how she worked there in a part-time summer job as a lifeguard. She had been certified at the YWCA nice. on North Forest Street, and she said the pool was large for its day. <laughs> so I thought that was just adorable yeah. that somebody went and interviewed these 90-year-olds I who know. remembered Fort Bellingham Beach. So, at any rate, they, you know, Fort Bellingham, they've got this new enclosed swimming pool. More people have automobiles and are less dependent on streetcars. So they're starting to get some business. They're giving Squalcom a run for their money now. Mm -hmm. Back at Squalcom Beach, the Blaney's continued to run the resort through 1929. And at that point, they just abandoned their lease. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure exactly why, but yeah, just wasn't paying off, I guess, at the time. Yeah. Darn. 1929, though. When did they start? I can't remember. I think it was 22. Yeah. They gave it a good okay. run. But yeah, that, that, that year-round pool, you can't really beat that. That's pretty rad. Yeah. Oh, there at the Fort Bellingham. Uh, so Blaney's former beach remained open under new management. The Blaney's moved back to their home stomping grounds in Oregon, opening more bowling alleys. I think, you know, that is definitely more year-round yeah. entertainment. Yeah. So. The beach resort seemed to sputter along, but without the publicity and fanfare that the Blaney's had brought to it, it sort of gradually faded into oblivion. Also, the Squalicum Phil continued to expand, and though people kept swimming in the area, it was becoming increasingly industrial and less of a scenic beach resort. The carnival atmosphere faded away, leaving only the bare minimum of amenities such as picnic tables. That's so sad. Uh, a group of boys in 1930 discovered that a freight car is not a good bathhouse. <laughs> so a group of boys swimming at Squalicum Beach learned Wednesday. They had left their clothes in one of the empty cars while they took a swim. But upon returning to dress, the clothes and car were gone. The car was found up the track some distance where a switch engine had conveyed it. So I love that, like, the bathhouses are gone. So these boys are like, ah, freight car. Freight car. <laughs> Box car will do. Mm, and, and their they, clothes like, got <laughs> moved up the tracks pretty great, it's, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sad though it's interesting and there was just so much dredging and filling which mm. had started you know all over our waterfront in the early 1900s and just, just kept on a rolling kept until on. our whole waterfront is vastly different than it was originally yeah so a lot of that flat area down closest to our beaches is fill y'all mm -hmm. that's been dredged and placed there so maybe don't buy condos just say <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I got concerned. So moving into the 1930s, we're just seeing increasing fill. They're building breakwaters out there to protect the fill from erosion. You've got plywood plant and things moving into the vicinity. But in 1936, there was again talk of a proposed public beach and bathhouse to be maintained by the county for the public. It does seem in 1939, I saw some references to lifeguard service being provided to the beach, which was pretty much the only amenity, I think. <laughs> yeah, great. A picnic table? <laughs> Oh, and yeah, lifeguard. Uh, and, lifeguard. <laughs> and as you know, industry presumably ramped up with the war efforts in the 1940s, I'm sure just increasing industrial use and fill and pollution and people just sort of gradually stopped bathing there. And there's yeah. not the exciting amenities. There's <laughs> increasing gross industry. But I love this. There's a little recollection of Blaney's Bathing Beach in a 1976 Herald interview with Eldridge Carr, who is a nephew of Hugh Eldridge. Oh, wow. And he said, quote, there was a store there. He'd sell pop and hot dogs. He kept a nice clean bathhouse. Carr recalled taking the wood steps to get to the beach from his uncle's house. We lived just up from the dance hall. I'd lay awake at night in the summer and listen to the music. Quite often I would sneak down there, but I was too young to participate. Carr also reflected that the filling of the Squalicum area by the port, quote, destroyed the beach. So sad, because all of those little accounts are just so dreamy. I know, it's adorable. And the fate of Fort Bellingham Beach, mm. um, again, from a 2006 article from Dean Kahn when he interviewed Andy Smith, and he said that by the 30s, some of the cabins had already been moved off the property. Uh, probably the Depression didn't oh, help. Yeah. And the resort closed entirely around 1933 or 34. The pool, there's it remains. We I showed Ren some pictures mm -hmm. of the concrete, just the base, the of, base it, of it yeah. is there, but it's covered with roots and vines and trees and brambles. So that's that for the bathing beaches. 
Yeah, it's so sad to see that end. I mean, the warriors really stepped up a lot of yeah. industrial uses. But it is just, it is such a weird closing to yeah. such a, everybody thinks of the 20s as just such a magical yeah. and interesting time, party time. Right. It's really like, it is kind of cool and kind of sad to see it just like, oh, uh, closing in. <laughs> we see the history closing in yeah. on it. I know. The whole story is, is so interesting to me because I live right by Squalicum Creek, what is today referred to as, quote, Little Squalicum Beach, also known as Gross Beach, <laughs> for <the> children. <laughs> and it's just so hard for me to picture a <sighs> bathing resort and Ferris wheel and all I that know. stuff down there. And I grew up by Wacom Falls Park, like I said in our previous episode, and that's where my swimming holes were. And yeah. that creek was relatively clean in that part of town at the <laughs> time. Yeah. But like when I moved here to this neighborhood and I was like, oh, Squalcom Creek's right there. And then I realized like, oh, my kids cannot ever <laughs> yeah, play the same. in yeah. that creek because it's so polluted. No, no temples in that creek. Yeah. So you had Bellingham Coal Mine out off Northwest and Birchwood area there. Yeah. And you had the Telephone, telephone pole plant poles. that was just a freaking nightmare. <laughs> of, there was like crazy environmental oh, stuff yeah. going on for years, sort of un- unchecked. Unchecked. Yep. So there's a lot of cleanup that's got to go on yes. in this area. Okay. You want to talk about that peer project a little bit? Yeah, yeah. What do we know about the peer project? We've heard little bits and pieces, maybe rebuilding the whole pier. From what I understand is that the Lehigh Cement Company, who sold it or whatever to the city, has to remove part of it. That's unsafe. I don't know. But so they're going to redevelop part of the pier and um, we'll see how that goes because it is a big old creosote gnarly structure. But I guess they did tailor dock, so it must be doable. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, you know, I'm glad North Side's getting a little love because a lot of the South Side former industrial places have been turned into parks, you know, in the 80s and have been improved upon since then with like tailor dock. So kind of getting some more love up on the North Side beaches is yeah is nice trying to get i mean I, there was a quote you know in the beginning of this podcast they were talking about where it was you know everything had given way to industry and and there's not a place to bathe in bellingham and that's totally true now i mean we've been living that with that for how yeah. many decades yeah. how many generations have we not been able to access our yeah. waterfront in bellingham i know it's pretty insane even say marine park in fairhaven and boulevard park mm-hmm. you know when those were first created they basically took big old, like, riprap chunks of busted up concrete, <laughs> and that was what, like, kind of lined the beaches. <laughs> so my whole life, even the nicer parks, like those, yeah. were lined with that, and that was, like, my idea of a beach was, like, <laughs> concrete with rebar <laughs> chunks. Chunks of old and, concrete. And, like, rocky beaches. Yeah. You know, that's what we had for beaches here. They were sort of these post-apocalyptic industrial wasteland beaches. Yeah. We used to go drink 40-ouncers at, quote, Texaco Beach. I bet you did. Which, we, which was Taylor Dock. <laughs> which was Taylor Dock. So it was called Texaco Beach because there was just some abandoned, like, oil tanks that had Texaco on the side. And the dock was abandoned and gnarly, but we would climb over the fence and go out to the end and jump off of it yes. anyway into the water. Oh, my god! We drank 40-ouncers, and that gave us courage. Yep. Well, <laughs> and we have a deep water bay, so you can jump uh, right off the edge there. It was not that deep, yeah, honestly. Well, kids are still doing that. I, I was just out there the other night, and a whole yeah. horde of kids it's, was out there yep. jumping off. Yeah, that dock. was the end of the school year thing for my kids. Oh, yeah, maybe that's what that uh-huh. was about. So I, I'm like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Memories of when I had to climb a fence with barbed wire to get yeah. on there. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> well, there's a trade-off because you could you had to climb the fence, but you could bring your 40 ounces out there and nobody was going to know. <laughs> These kids would not yeah, get away with bringing no. their 40s. No, no, no. <laughs> to totally I, hopefully they're not drinking 40 ounces. I don't recommend it. <laughs> Well, that's very motherly. Nasty swell. (laughs) Yeah, and I take my kids to Marine Park, and now they've made a nice sort of sandy beach there. there. And you know, my children would swim. Yeah, where I I would have never dreamed of swimming there because it it was just weird, (laughs) weird and gross and gravel and (laughs) and and that to me is just really interesting. The whole how if you look at our parks in Bellingham in general, so you've got some of the main old parks that were kind of donated early on, like Wacom Falls. Park, Fairhaven Park, Cornwall Park. There were sort of large land donations in this effort to have some green space and preserve some of it. But then a lot of the parks that have been created since then 
all former oh. industrial sites. Right. So that's all brownfields. Because that's as they all call we can do. <laughs> well, and there was this huge movement, I think, starting in the 1980s. So the Environmental Protection Agency starts looking at what do you do with these abandoned yeah. industrial sites as industry and manufacturing all got shipped overseas and yeah. went by the wayside. Right. You have all these towns with just empty old industrial sites yeah. everywhere. And what do you do with them? And, you know, cleanup was a huge issue and liability. And so they started to look at ways to create funding for cleanup and deal with these sites. And a big thing was like, we'll turn them into parks so you can get grant money and clean it up. Yeah. And if you make it a public space. Well, hallelujah, humans. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Yeah. And our going. biggest, I mean, waterfront whole redevelopment is that whole site of George Pacific, mm. open paper mills. Oh, yeah. The, the granddaddy of yeah, <laughs> cleanup. Yeah. And that is yeah. huge yeah. with our pump track and our yeah. trackside little container beer garden village down there. So those of you new to Bellingham, I mean, just really appreciate what you got down there because it's, <laughs> I mean, that was inaccessible. Yeah. It's great. And public access to the water is a thing around the globe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because everybody wants to live by the water and of course all the rich people buy up what's not industrial land. Exactly. <laughs> so just having any access to the water has become sort of a, a rights issue, like mm-hmm. a public rights. <laughs> I'm glad we're finally coming around on that. I think it's important. Uh, I think this was a great way to tackle that, a little little history for yeah. you and how we're evolving and things are changing on the waterfront. But yeah. I think especially for Bellingham, that is it's such a story of our community. We'll have show notes and references and oh yeah, some we'll put some good pic- stuff, pictures and our further deep dives into all of this stuff. Well, I think with that, I mean, we kind of covered the moral of our story pretty darn well, yeah, Colby. Okay. And we got to hear about your deep dive <laughs> into Texaco Beach, the waters of Texaco Beach. My so. actual dive. I think we <laughs> your literal like a dive. dive beach too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. really a dive of a beach. We'll see everybody next time. Yeah. Thanks next for listening. Episode. Bring back bathing beaches. <laughs> Bring back knitted bathing suit. This is Bellingham. We can do that. We have the power. <laughs> With little bees on them. Okay, we're going to find... Put a bird on it. Happen. It's like, put a bee on <laughs> it. It is. <laughs> it's our new slogan. <laughs> all right. Peace, Peace out. out. <laughs> Bye. We'd like to thank you all for listening to Belling History with the Good Time Girls. Do subscribe or review our podcast on your favorite podcast platforms. What you saw? Like us on all the social medias. You can support us on Patreon if you feel like it. Check out our other tours and events. Read our show notes, our blog, and all of that is at bellinghistory.com. also like to thank, of course, Devin Champlin and the late great Lucas Hicks for the use of the Gallus Brothers song, Too Bad West Coast Blues. You can find the Gallus Brothers tunes on Bandcamp, and you can find Devin Champlin at Champlin Guitars in Bellingham. Lost my hat, lost my brim, looking like a coast that's swinging from a limb that's too bad, too bad. Well, I got no bug and I got no smokes, I look like Grandpap and all of his folks, that's too bad. next time for more Belling History. Belling History. Thank you. Thanks.